everybody was looking quite shocked because people that have a decent understanding, you know, how can you ensure security in a container when you have to build it and you have no possibility of looking what is the inside the container. So how should we do that? How should we stage containers? Should we put them from registry to registry, from test development to testing to production? Do we, do we really need a complete base OS image container? Uh, luckily, we had security in the meeting. Well, lucky for the ops people, maybe. Not lucky for developers, because the security mentioned, no, no, no. Security must be done by development, because ops can't look into the container. It's an isolated thing. And inside a container, there are only these things that are needed to run the application, not the full bloated operating system. And please, no init system like SysFi init or system B. So just the application and maybe the libraries that are needed, nothing else. And to prevent issues with the platform, developers must name constraints like kernel capabilities and cgroup settings. And then came the big questions. What is kernel capabilities? What is cgroups? I've chosen a text here uh, saying by security we probably should meet when we understood the basics of containers. Um, I had to do this in a polite way because there's a code of conduct around here. The original term was much more harsher, uh, insulting people why I have you stolen my time and that's already mentioned in a friendly way. So it, it was an interesting meeting over there and the developers learned that they have to learn new additional things which they haven't taken care of in the past, like kernel capabilities and C groups. So this is, the, this is the story of how they initially started we would like to do containers in our environment. So what's with these containers? So prior we had that meeting, when you walked around development area, there was some, some background noise. You could hear it everywhere. Everybody was taught saying just Docker. And after that meeting, that noise vanished. Well, for two days. And then it appeared again. So what's this, what's what makes the developers so happy having Docker containers? So having Docker as a build system for containers or even running containers? What, what, what is so important for them? Well, the basic thing, what Docker Inc. did was, uh, yeah, we don't need configuration management anymore. It's so easy to deploy and run. You see, I have it, the whole application stack on my laptop. It's working flawlessly. It took me 10 minutes to deploy everything, and it's cool and it's working. Okay, how do we get that laptop into the data center? How do we scale a laptop? Difficult things now. It's so easy to test and verify. We don't need testing anymore. We test in production anyway. We learned it today, through this morning. And it's far more easier to fix issues. We can, because we can deploy much more faster. So these are all things that yeah, people bring in when they start working with containers because they say, oh, I did the, the, the form, there's a website, and it says just run these commands and everything is working. Yeah, and when the containers are running, yeah, they are running. Self-eating things. Maybe they even self-developing things, so you, even developers just have to hit the button for deploy to production. So everything is automated, even the development process by itself. Security is something I, well, what's, what was the term? It's built in into Docker. Well, okay, interesting. And you don't have to need logs. We don't need them because it's working, self-healing. So when it's self-healing, why do you still need logs? So no need for logs when things just repair themselves automatically. And you don't have to buy dedicated hardware because it's, in Germany, we call it the Siemens Lufthaven. So it's the Siemens, the company, the air hook. You just mount it somewhere in free room and it will just stay there and you can put on it whatever you like. So same, similar to containers seems to be. You just put a container somewhere and it will just be there and will be functional. So no need for hardware. We're going serverless. 
Well, what Docker did in the first time, and why developers are so happy that they have Docker available, is to format the packaging format of a container, made in a super simple way. By just saying, here is a Docker file, provide the commands that you want to add layer by layer, uh, provide a script that will get copied into the container and provide information about run and entry points, so run commands and entry points. So what is it that the container should start when it gets initialized? You can really imagine these layers are like compared to version control things. So you build layer by layer. But still, containers somehow need compute. They need to run somewhere. They need to have infrastructure around it. You need memory for the container, you need storage for a container, as long as you want to store something, don't store it in the container, place it outside of the container. So you still need some infrastructure, and from an ops perspective, the best thing to explain containers to an ops person is a container is a binary, and you just run it. Maybe you have options to configure the behavior of the binary, minus minus enable debug, or by environment variables. But basically, that's it. And this makes it easier for ops people to understand the concept of containers because they don't have to deal with the build process of containers. They should run containers. Well, they don't know about containers. That is the reason why they are super afraid of containers because they don't understand the concept. But they understand the concept of running a binary on a system. This is something they are completely used to. Yeah, there's ISQLD, there's HTTPD, there's SSH, it's just a binary. And the same pattern is now what we have as a container, just running a binary. People start with Docker because they say, it's so super easy. I can install it on my Mac, I can install it on my Windows system, on my Linux system. I just have a Docker file, hopefully in a version control system. I can build my container, I can run my container, I can test my container. Everything's great. Well, where do they get the container from? Ah, there's uh, Docker Hub I.O. You just uh, do a Docker call and then you have everything available locally. And it, it starts faster because it only has to be downloaded every time again. Okay. Uh, who's afraid installing software using a K-K pipe sudo bash? At least I'm super afraid to do it. And now we have that concept of pulling Docker images out of the wild, wild internet. Always good people everywhere, for sure. And we want to run them in our infrastructure. Who's checking Docker containers for security? It's just a couple, three, four, five people only. Okay, let's do it the other way around. Maybe that's the only people using containers. Who's using containers in production? That's far more people. Okay. So you want to have security in your containers and not just call something from the internet. Especially in Germany, we have lots of customers, lots of companies, especially the larger companies, that have strict security regulations which have been written down on permanent paper back in 1960, anything. And now they adopt these to modern technology. And they say the live production platform may not access anything outside of the infrastructure. It may not access something from the internet. Which is a problem because we now have to build some infrastructure around containers locally in your own infrastructure. For example, the local registry system. The developer's workstation is the machine where he pulls an image and where he pushes the image into the local registry. But then he, is he or she is responsible for what's inside the container. They must be sure that they have just that what they have. One customer of us, uh, security was very clear about that. And they said there is one container that is allowed to use the scratch container, which is the empty, let's say the empty, uh, the empty thing around which was describes a container without any content. Yeah, and then we place a tarball inside. Okay, what's inside the tarball? Are the base operating system? Mm. No, just put the Go binary inside. Oh, we don't do Go, we do Node.js. Okay, then please just install Node.js and the libraries you need. Yeah, and we need NetStat, and we need SS, and we need SSH, and no, 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 it's just the binary you're deploying. You're not doing a full-blown operating system. This is a difficult thing 
to explain to both sides, to developers, understanding. Basic, some people, some developers have a really good understanding of that, but most people barely are saying, we are so afraid of what we have to do over there, we are stepping back from managing containers. Because it's so complex, managing containers. Charity was it this morning, I suppose, who said, when you, have a, when you can run it in a lamp stack, run it in a lamp stack. Don't go run on huge Kubernetes cloud provider pass bonding networks. That's too difficult to understand because we have these hundreds of little tiny things around in your platform. Someone a while ago mentioned it already. I forgot to write the time when he was doing that. I suppose it was somewhere to the year 2000 approximately. I was saying, when we have something super complex, I know when I started working in IT, uh, that was a, a finance institution, and uh, they had a, a nice elder person sitting next to me, and you know, always said, Martin, KISS. Who's aware of the KISS principle? Everybody. Who's building KISS platforms? <laughs> ah, okay. So you know about the principle, you know about KISS. Keep it super silly, simple, stupid. Keep, keep every, it will become complex by itself. So why build it complex in the first place? Just try to spin it down into the most simple solution that you can think of. And that is a solution that is afterwards manageable. When we go a little bit to the past and say, that let's, do a, let's do a time warp by now. So heading back to 1960, I suppose, uh, until nowadays and in the near future. So the lower level is the history thing with uh, that side is the past and that side is the future. In the past, we had mainframes. Wow, how many mainframes did a company have? One. Oh, larger companies had two. Uh, it was the boss of IBM that mentioned there's a world market for 50 computers. Yeah? Okay. Okay, then we learned about uh, personal computers. So you still have a monitor, but you're no longer connected by a terminal session to the mainframe, but you have your own personal computer next to it. Far more easier for installing games, for example. But you have more of them. Every employee must now have a personal computer. So when it came to personal computer afterwards, we said uh, it's difficult to use the hardware in the most, yeah, most usable way. So people were deploying multiple things on hardware. So there's one service in the morning hours, there's one in the afternoon, and during nights we run calculations which must be finished by the next morning, so we have a good usage on the hardware. But people learn it's complex, having multiple things on one system. Let's separate and isolate them and put them into virtual machines. At one customer in Berlin, they had 15 servers hardware, so they first running purely on hardware, and then we decided, no, the development environment, we said the development environment is now spin up as virtual machines, it allows us to spin up more virtual machines. 15 pieces of hardware used for two development environments, now host up to 200 virtual machines, being 8 to 10 different development environments, so even a more, far more numbers. And then we started introducing silently, without letting developers know. We talk with security first. We want to use containers for CI CD testing. In this case, it was especially for puppet acceptance testing. We just want to spin up a system. Yes, it's a blow fully bloated operating system inside, but it's just for the testing purpose, and we tear the container down after we finish the test. We don't keep the container long living. And then some of the developers learned, oh wait, there is a Docker D running on our CI/CD system. Hey, that's cool, let's build containers. They weren't directly looking and monitoring what's happening inside the uh, local registry, but uh, one day the local registry just died with no disk space available. And they learned, we have around about three and a half terabyte of images Docker images that are lying around on the local registry. The weirdest things one can see, but you can see the number increases, let's say, exponentially. Well, that itself is not something that I would consider a problem. It's just we have smaller units of software spun over a larger amount of instances. 
The other thing we can look at is what kind of uptime do these systems have? Has one ever experienced a downtime on a mainframe? I haven't. They have a maintenance window which is announced and then they do something and then the system is running again. With PCs we have to do updates like, uh, oh, kernel upgrades. Rebooting after a kernel upgrade. Perfectly. There was a nice advertisement video from a Hamburg-based company uh, and they, they put it on YouTube. I don't know the company name, but I just remembered the weird video where the three IT people were having a card with a server and a universal power supply and a GSM dollar connected to it, so it still can react to ping. And they were moving their gateway in public transportation to the new office. I said, we, have, we tried it to not shut it down. It has an uptime of 680 days. Oh, great. Ops people are so proud of their uptime. What is it that you consider my security thing about a system with 800 days of uptime? Usually they try to, say, isolate that thing from the network uh, immediately. So you have lower uptime now on personal computers. Yeah, but VMs are available always. Uh, when you live migrate them for a short period of time, they are no longer available by being migrated. VMs by itself are more easy to create, so they are more easy to tear down again. So it's less uptime for VMs. What's your average uptime on a container? So in the environment that I am working, it's usually around about five minutes. That's the maximum time we have for an acceptance testing for public code that the system is properly configured. After five minutes, the container is gone. No longer living. We had some discussions with other people saying, okay, what is, what is an okay uptime for the container? Some people were saying, well, days, others were saying weeks. Nobody mentioned months. Nobody mentioned years. Nobody mentioned 680 days. So expect containers to be short-living instances in your infrastructure. Is this a problem? Um, don't know. Uh, maybe. So how many people do deal with these platforms? Oh, in the past we had the three people down in the cellar maintaining the mainframe. They were having beers downstairs, somewhere nearby, always warm, summer and winter. Then we had the, uh, we call it twin tree administrator, so the walking around from PC to PC, I have an update for you, may I please insert the disk, going to the next one, one by one, so you have the people walking around, there were more people, maybe one or two, but that's it. Virtual machines, okay, now we don't no longer run around from system to system because we manage, manage them from a centralized location. But we have plenty more systems and a couple of people more. And with containers, don't expect to get new hires in the same amount as you spin up containers. So one mainframe, one employee, 10 servers, 10 employees, 300 VMs, 300 employees, maybe in total for the company, but not within the IT department. What does that lead to? How much did you automate in the past? Oh, in the mainframe? Uh, Wait, I can tell you later until I have changed the tape. So there was no real automation. With personal computers, people were thinking about, okay, let's do some basic OS installation in an automatic way. Doing the TFTP, R, R stuff, and do some kickstarting, auto-adjusting, pre-seeding. With VMs, they said, oh, we have to do more because VMs get created and tear down again, and uh, we don't want to do manual work every time we re-instantiate a virtual machine. So this is the part where, where the, the things that uh, Eric mentioned this morning, CM Engine, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Solstack, where all these tools go around to help you more easily create the functional working virtual machine for your environment. And now we come to Docker. Like a platform where you have connected a different relator permanently. Things are up, things are down, things are up again. More instances are up, more instances are down. So not, you don't have really something stable to measure for it or to configure because it's pre-configured inside the container. Yeah, 100% automation. I still remember one of my project managers. 
as you might have started. 100% automation is impossible. That's, that's super insane. It's too, super cost intense. Don't you know about the 80-20 pattern? Who is aware of the 80-20 pattern? Almost everybody. Nice. Cool. They say you can do 80% of the work in 20% of the time. The remaining 20% of work takes long about 80% of the time. Well, maybe that was true in the past when we had personal computers, long living instances. But when we now deal with containers, this 80-20 pattern still exists, but in a slightly different thing. We now need 80% of our time doing the 20% not automated. So, what is it that we want to have to do automatically? Uh, we need to do a joining on also Linux instances. We don't want someone to do the AD join manually. Especially when we say, I'm tearing them down, I'm spinning them up again, so someone has to do the AD join again. While he's doing the AD join, the system recognizes I don't need that VM anymore and spins it down. Uh, what was the work done for? Nothing. So, have 400% automation, especially when it comes to running containers in your infrastructure. You will have no time logging into 500 containers and do changes on them. You rebuild them and redeploy them. So, okay, the first thing was we now want to have containers and we have our single host where we run the container. So, we have to think about what is it that we should take care when we have to yeah, support running containers in an infrastructure. That's from an ops perspective in that way. The first thing, consider a container to be something that is not living as long as you be at the company. 5, 10, 25 years. It's a short living instance. Have a look at the 12 factor. Uh, 12 Factor was uh, originally done by Ruby developers saying you can easily spin up uh, Ruby instances on our hosted platform. And it's a nice concept where we say you have to adopt from a developer's perspective your application to be capable of making use of this microservice supporting infrastructure. They talk about logs, logs being event streams. They, they talk about different things. What is it that should be in a, in, in a small system, in a microservice, which should be not in a microservice? Where do you store persistent data? What kind of persistent data? Oh, your customer billing information? Do they store credit cards, email addresses? Is it a support portal where people have reported in in the past and they want to have a history seeing what is it that we have reported in in the past? You will have somewhere persistent data. So ensure that you still have this persistent data when you tear down your Docker containers. Because when you tear down a Docker container, you stop a container, then that this information is gone, it disappeared. <coughs> Automate everything. Whether you go for some kind of cloud-based container runtime engine, then these people will do the work for you for automatically spinning up systems that allow you to well, create containers. If you, be, if you run on-premise, automate the stuff. Like you did in the past with all your databases, application servers, storage systems, log systems. Now it's just another infrastructure component, which means it's a container runtime engine. And I want to spin it up, and I want to have it directly available as container runtime engine. I don't want to log in and somehow do some magic shell script command inside the system. You need metrics. Who's doing monitoring? I stop doing monitoring. Monitoring makes no sense. I collect metrics. Far more important, far more, it gives you far more insight into your infrastructure compared to a standard monitoring. And on top of most metrics, you can align patterns where you say, as long well, this is a standard pattern, and when the metric goes beyond the standard pattern, you can even say, I have to report this somewhere. Email, SMS, whatsoever. Please collect metrics for all of the systems. This is something you have to have prior to start using containers in a larger scale because afterwards you will completely lose control on what is it that I'm having, having what's running where. Tearing <laughs> down containers? Cool. 
do everything automated. So also any kind of deployment, any kind of, we want to have a playground because we want to test this new cool scripting language, whether we are able to use that one. Automate everything, build everything in your CI CD pipelines. And please do stop manually clicking your CI CD pipelines in your professional enterprise CI CD pipelining tool. Have it in version control, have a file next to it. And this file describes your CI CD pipeline. So there's the project. The project is a software development. The software development causes a build system the test system, and afterwards we get a container built, and all these steps are described in a single file, your CI CD file. Well, it's a Jenkins file for Jenkins, a Travis file for Travis, a GitLab CI YAML file for GitLab. Choose something where you can easily change the whole CI CD pipeline by just changing one file and not clicking in an interface. Automate your build process and get yourself dashboards. We have collected the metrics already. Ah, great, so we now know already about memory consumption, network latency, uh, do we have network separation on specific hosts, maybe due to a combination of several different containers running on it, which maybe should run separately from each other. You still doing Puppet? Well, run your Puppet infrastructure in a container. There's a nice project from Puppet called Puppetware, where you just have everything in a container. Uh, I suppose something similar will be there from Ansible and their tower, that you just have tower as a container. Just take care of persistent data. Okay, now, now we have that single host container runtime engine. So we can spin up a container over here, we can spin up a container over there. Yeah, that's nice, okay. Um, but uh, then I add new systems, and how can these containers cross host to communication together? I don't want to use the host networking underneath because they want to have an isolated network, each container. This brings you to container orchestration. So you need to find out, for example, you want to do hardware maintenance on one of your container runtime engines. Oh, we somehow have to clear down the containers, we do hardware to shut the whole system down, we have people replacing hardware, uh, then they power it up again and the system boots again, and uh, oh, in the meantime, what about your containers? They're gone. So you want to have something like a container orchestration, which allows you to continue your, your, your business even when doing hardware maintenance. Think about the cloud providers. When they do hardware maintenance, they never do hardware maintenance on a single piece of hardware. They just shut down the whole data center. That is why we have these availability zones with them. You want to have multiple nodes working together as a cluster. And you want to have an orchestration engine. Say, I need five of these which connect to two of these. That is what you describe then somehow. You take care of how does traffic get in my cluster and how does traffic get out of my cluster. Either you say the database is uh, still running as is, so there's physical hardware, there's the database in it, uh, but now there are applications that have to talk to the database, or you have offered an API and customers are using your API, so even from the internet, your containers have to get traffic from the internet. This is what we call ingress. Take care of maintenance. There will be maintenance. Yes, serverless. Yes, still running on servers. It's just we don't own them anymore. Someone wants to do maintenance on the hardware. And then you deploy multiple containers, these binaries from Ops perspective, and you glue them together with a software defined networking stack. Then this container has the following network, the other has the following network, and there are following policies between these two networks. Who's using Helm charts? Who knows what Helm charts is? A larger group of people, okay. Uh, when I first saw a Helm chart, it directly reminded me of a puppet module, chef, cookbook, Ansible playbook. It's a similar pattern. It just describes binaries that you want to glue together and run together next to each other. Consider a local registry is really nice. You're not relying on foreign infrastructure. 
uh, is my provider that connects my office to the internet, is this fully working, does my provider have no issues and no peering issues to some other network, and the company that is hosting this nice container service, container registry service, maybe they have an issue. You don't want to rely by the deployments of foreign infrastructure. You still use standard operating systems, so you somehow have your RPM or Debian mirrors, hopefully, locally, and don't use the upstream stuff. You don't want to rely on foreign infrastructure. The same is when it comes to containers. You don't want to rely on foreign container registry services. You want to keep them locally. Just give them enough storage so that you don't have the issue that we had in our unknown Docker installation. Okay, do I run self-hosted? Or what is the term? Cloud-native. Yeah, cloud-native is cool. Self-hosted means you have a data center. Use it. You know how to manage it? Use it. You have no hardware left in the data center, all completely in use. Well, start a little bit maybe with a managed solution. So something, either, either you just get virtual machines, or you even say, I'm going to have the complete managed cluster thing. So, and then people start talking about KAS. There is either local Docker or there's Kubernetes. There is nothing in between. No. When I first saw Kubernetes and looking into details, see all these little components that you can take and replace and take and replace it might be an open stack. So, the funny picture from, uh, from Mark to, uh, this morning. Where he said, here we have the server, then we have this OpenStack plugin infrastructure, on top we have the Kubernetes plugin infrastructure. So plugin via plugin via plugin. Run, run by plugins, managed by plugins, itself being a plugin. You don't have to. We have customers that say, no, Kubernetes is far too hard to understand and far too hard to manage. And we don't want to have a hosted solution, a managed solution. We want to do it by ourselves. So basically they say, hey, let's go for Swarm and just use Docker Swarm. Some companies saying we already have cloud and we already use Terraform. So just expand Terraform to be capable of deploying your Kubernetes stack next to it. Different solutions. Choose the tools either which are already there and are capable of helping you, or choose the tools where your teams are familiar with or where yourself are familiar with. It makes the adoption far more higher when you have something at hand where you know how it's working and you feel comfortable in using it. Okay, everything is container. I have a container next to my work desk, I have a container in the data center, everything is running inside the container. For sure, everything. Who's using or who, or who is forced to use Oracle databases? You make, you make Oracle super, super happy when you want to run them on a Kubernetes stack. Super happy. You pay per CPU. And since the database can run anywhere, you have to license all of your CPUs of your Kubernetes cluster. Have you thought about that? So maybe, especially that is a use case where you say, no, 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 maybe it's not good doing everything in a container. Consider some applications. Usually containers have health checks. What is the timeout for a health check? And you can configure it. Yes, for sure. You can say, I'm, I'm starting. The weirdest start example for a container was at a Berlin based customer. They have containerized their JBoss installation, which takes around about eight and a half minutes to start and being completely functional. The port is open after a couple of seconds. Yes, but until the application it does respond with uh, no longer four or five errors takes eight and a half minutes. So maybe that's not the right thing to place into a container. Especially when you want to use containers for scalability. You say, I have that application around here. Say, you're selling tickets. First of April, you're making fun, making joke. Elvis is not dead. Here are 100 tickets for his real last concert. And people start, Elvis is not dead. Buy that ticket. So you want to have immediately instances up with well, the web page saying uh, April's full, everything's fine, we don't have a concert. But you don't want the customer experience to say, oh, there's just an error on the web page, because then they hit the reload button time after time. 
So you want to spin up something fast and clear it down fast. Spinning up fast means the application has to start fast. Legacy applications, storage systems, EMC, NetApp, DB2. Uh, are you sure you want to put that SAP installation in a container? No. I doubt. Now you can? Okay. When it comes to monitoring, things for ops will be different. They are used to this old static monitoring. There is the server. Server has a name. Has a name. Real name. A fixed IP address and a name. We take care of it. It's our, it's our pet that we take care of. And the pet is something we can look into. Is the pet still living? Is the pet still alive? And now we have systems that yeah, spin it up, spin it down, constantly moving in your infrastructure. Uh, oh, they have announced the maintenance in that data center. Let's move all up from all services to the new data center so we are sure we don't have an outage when they do the maintenance. So you have super dynamic resources, which means you can't deal with a static monitoring solution. You have to have something super dynamic for monitoring infrastructure. You usually, from an application perspective, just say, I want to be sure that the application is working. So the global health status for your platform is important. Everything else, look for the cloud factor, is done on per application level. Also developers have to change, because now they have to provide events that get somehow transferred into your metrics connection system, so you know for sure, do some applications throw under specific conditions a 503 error, or a 403 error, or a 404 error. And uh, one customer, uh, we decided to go for Prometheus. They first had two solutions in place, a monitoring solution and Prometheus for metrics connecting. And after four weeks, they said, these dashboards from Prometheus are gorgeous. What we kind of information we have never seen before on saturation on our infrastructure on hardware level is something we have never seen before. We now use Prometheus also for alerting people in case of outages, so they even do that with Prometheus. You're using Puppet Enterprise, well, have a look at Puppet Discovery. That helps you to identify what kind of containers do I have run anywhere. Look for C advisor. There are plenty of solutions open source based around. Well, enterprise, this, uh, Puppet Discovery is an enterprise solution, but there are open source solutions around. Check for that. Yeah, the myths. The myths. Serverless. Yeah. We found something new. Obsolescence. Yeah. Do we know more words with less that make sense? Serverless, obsless, useless, brainless. Clueless. Painless, clueless. So plenty of things out to do with less. Yeah. So just because you say we are going serverless means we don't own the hardware anymore. It's owned by someone else and you rent it for you, to you. So you have to pay for it. Obsless. What does ops this mean? So we don't, no, don't need ops anymore because developer can click together the infrastructure they want to have underneath. This was done by people you paid for. So there are still ops people. Let's say it's not really ops, let's say it's automation engineers that provide you an interface to do what ops was doing in the past. But still it's similar to being ops people. Yeah, and the cloud is so cheap. It's so super cheap. So run on our own, own data center is completely old school and just burns money, tons of money. Uh, one customer ran the hardware. And luckily there was finance already quite early involved. And finance explained IT the differences between capital expenses and operational expenses. And then they recognized up to a certain point, let's say amount of instances you're running at a cloud provider, it might be cheaper going to cloud compared to running your own data center. But there will be the point when you grow and grow and grow in cloud infrastructure where they say, please, can you go for an own data center? This is capital expenses. It's, it keep, it's, it's kept inside the company. Operational expenses are just expenses and we give them someone else. So please check with finance what is the best solution for your location and uh, whether you really want to go everything into cloud, or you want to go partly into cloud, or check what is the best thing that you can do. So, 
With that image, when I see that image the first time, um, I said, yeah, I like to have that. Because that's Pandora's box. Uh, but Pandora's box maybe is a little bit too hard when it comes to containers. It's not Pandora's. But let's say we had a small box, we opened it, and now we have a container. It's cool what you can place inside small boxes, huge containers. Fantastic. So we see container adoption increases. More and more companies thinking about this microservice concept because they say we have to go agile anywhere. Anyway, uh, the development, for developers it is easy to deploy and to develop small applications instead of huge application stacks. They are faster when it comes to security fixes, faster when it comes to upgrades, as long as they are compatible in the rest of the infrastructure. So for ops people, please, Stop complaining about, oh, the developers want containers. No, like it. Build your own system, build your own things. You want to do automation in your infrastructure, you want to test everything. So please provide a CI CD build pipeline built on containers completely. That is the point where you, as ops people, learn about containers which are afterwards consumed by developers. And developers will deliver you containers and they will take care of the containers that they are functional and working. Well, you will do that together usually. Automate everything. Just saying, one, one customer, he came to the ops team and the ops team said, yeah, um, okay, we have now this uh, open shift installation finished. Oh, nice. Uh, so can we clear it now and redeploy it again? Uh, no, we did lots of things manually. Uh, please, that is not a proof of concept, that's a pile of bread. You just build it manually, is it a proof of concept? A proof of concept is something which you can spin up automatically, tear down and spin it up again and it's the same state as before. So automate everything is part of your initial project. Choose the container tools, choose the runtime engines. Sometimes the developer will give you some, uh, we already use this tool, so they will give you some information on specific tools they have made a decision for. But also try to develop these tools for your own installations that you run as a container. And to finish is that ops should not take containers. Ops should take something they don't have under their control and not containers. Thank you. We have five minutes left for questions. Baking. The question is, uh, how do you usually bake images? Uh, no, so the, the, the images you're building are built by your Docker. For, let's say with Docker for this example, using Docker as the package format for containers. You have a Docker file, and usually you make a decision on what is my base image that I want to use. So you can use Alpine, where you already have the base for S inside, and you just add stuff that you need. You want to have a Node.js application, so please install Node.js and add your application. Uh, Puppet has nothing to do inside a container. Configuration management itself has nothing to do inside a container. I know companies that use containers as compared to virtual machines. They have configuration management done inside their containers, but it's an empty pattern to a container. Give it up for Martin. Yay!